G'day and welcome to the program. With Anzac Day fast approaching, it's time to remember and honour those who served their country in war. And here on York Peninsula, one bloke has gone to extraordinary lengths to do just that. I'll show you around the Bublikawi Military Museum later in the program. And what else is on the program today? Bryony takes a look at the latest supersized artwork capturing the spirit of our West Coast. And from street art to fine art, the rare collection of impressionist masterpieces now on show. So effective. But first, here's Michael. The majestic Murray River, one of Australia's most famous waterways, flows over two and a half thousand kilometres from its source to the sea. It's long been a favourite holiday destination for families, water sport fans and nature lovers. And there's no better way to see it than from the deck of the PS Murray Princess. Look at that! Welcome aboard the largest authentic inland paddle wheeler in the Southern Hemisphere. Built in 1986 by the Veenstra family, the PS Murray Princess is a unique sight on our waterways. Its design clearly inspired by the charm of yesteryear. PS Murray Princess, what does the PS stand for? The paddle ship. Paddle, no, see, we all think paddle steamer. No. Paddle because, ship. Yeah, because this doesn't run on steam. No, oh, it runs true. on uh, diesel engine. Behind the wheel of this paddle ship is Captain Craig Owen and First Officer Alan Beatty. And along with 22 crew, they delight in showing off this part of Australia to up to 120 guests at a time. Oh, look, they're, they're in awe, really, of, of what goes on here and what they see. You know, they, they don't expect to see cliffs like that. They don't expect to see the, the wildlife, the pelicans and the, everything else like that, you know. We've had a lot of people that travel to Mississippi and they said that this is even better than Mississippi. I've joined the Fortnite Outback Heritage Cruise, which takes in a stunning section of our river between Manham and Blanchetown, with its towering sandstone cliffs teeming with bird life. There's one down here looking for their dinner, I suspect. They're quite amazing. The Murray Princess is just shy of 70 metres long and is spread out over a number of levels. Up top, the sun deck is a popular place to kick back and enjoy the passing parade while below, two lounges offer views of the huge stern paddle wheel through a two-storey observation window. As the sun prepares to set, it's time to tie up at Young Husband for the night, which gives passengers a chance to stretch their legs ashore while the kitchen gears up for a busy night. The culinary highlight of the cruise, for foodies like me, is the captain's dinner, a spectacular smorgasbord unveiled in a dramatic fashion. I now present to you our captain's seafood buffet. Hey, how good is this? There's so much food here. Seriously, you'll never go hungry, it's amazing. Bill Clark, the onboard entertainer, keeps toes tapping and spirits high as the night rolls on. The lively chatter filling the dining room and bar, a clear indication of the many friendships made or strengthened during this voyage. The trip on this boat is just amazing. The crew are fantastic. There's 10 of us come down for this cruise and we enjoyed every second. I camped on the riverside with my children when they were little and we used to watch the Murray Princess go by and we thought, oh, one day we'll have enough money to go on that. When I found out it wasn't that much money anyway, I was on. And when it's finally time to hit the hay, there's three accommodation options on offer. From impressive staterooms with double beds and mini bars, to outside and inside cabins, with the majority of these featuring twin beds. The PS Murray Princess operates every day of the year, with three, four and seven night voyages between Manham, Murray Bridge and Salter Station. All cruises offer a number of optional tours and off-boat excursions, so you'll never be short on entertainment with this lot. Come on, get on for me, Now, if this looks like your kind of holiday, why not join me on board in August for four nights of fantastic cruising? Love to see you. 
I'll be hosting a very special gardening cruise with theme talks and quizzes. So make sure you jump on the website to find out more and to book. After the break, the stunning colours of Impressionism. Adelaide is a very long plane trip from Paris, but over the next few months, Paris has come to us. Here at the Art Gallery of South Australia, a rare collection called Colours of Impressionism is on display, and it will take your breath away. 65 Impressionist masterpieces are on loan exclusively to the Art Gallery of South Australia from the renowned Musée d'Orsay in Paris. Its curator Paul Perrin flew in to oversee the installation of these priceless works and explains why Impressionist painters were the artistic revels of their time. They were radical because they chose modern subjects that were not really in favour in the academic world, like railway stations, cafes, restaurants, streets of Paris, boulevards. They were also using new colours, new pigments, in a very bold way, with broken brushstrokes, which was also completely new at that time. In 1868, Claude Monet's The Magpie was considered such a disaster, he couldn't even show it. But today, it's known as one of his finest paintings. It was too daring, too bold. <laughs> too out there. Too, yes. <laughs> <laughs> to, to make such a big painting with such an anecdotal small subject. And you have this uh, very beautiful effect with the magpie, mm -hmm. which is just a black it's dot. my favourite part. <laughs> Although the works of Monet are at the heart of the exhibition, you'll also find a treasure of other iconic artists, such as Renoir and Pissarro, gracing the walls. This is a painting by the, a painter named Paul Signac. It's almost an abstract painting, mm. just dots of colours that are intentioned. It's so effective. The gallery's elegant 19th century elder wing is the perfect setting to study the paintings in every detail. Flooded with natural light, you can literally see the texture and life in every brush stroke. This is truly one of the most extraordinary art exhibitions you're likely to find anywhere in the world. And there's no jet lag involved, so don't miss out. The Colours of Impressionism exhibition will be held until the 29th of July. Visit the Art Gallery's website for more information. And we've got five double passes to give away. Head to our Facebook page to enter. You've just got to see these stunning masterpieces in person. Next, one man's remarkable collection of military might. Many are hidden gems waiting to be uncovered while travelling the back roads of South Australia. At the bottom of York Peninsula, where you'd least expect to find it, sits one of the most amazing collections of military history. Set in the quiet paddocks of Bublacowie, one man has lived the motto, if you build it, they will come. I do own everything here. There's nothing here. I've, I've bought it or have been donated it to me personally. So I want to donate it to the people of the York Peninsula. It's the lifelong obsession of military enthusiast and collector Chris Saw, who with his late wife Enid, purchased the old Bublacowie school as a retirement project. But Chris is not the retiring type. He's covered the country in a quest to commemorate the bravery of ordinary folk. And often he's found it on the peninsula he loves, like these moving mementos from a Moonta family, the Chapmans, who certainly did their bit. The oldest brother was killed at Tobruk. The three other brothers served on the Kokoda Trail. From propellers off PC-3 Orions to howitzers used in Vietnam, it's an overpowering collection of military might. Chris Saw is passionate about our military history, so much so that he spent nearly 20 years compiling one of the most amazing private collections in the country. And he's particularly passionate about the stories of two York Peninsula locals. They say a lot about ordinary people tested in extraordinary times. Blokes like the late Ken Keatley, who enlisted in the RAAF in World War II. A decision that would take him from the peaceful wheat and barley fields of York Peninsula 
to the industrial heartland of Germany. How many missions did he fly? Ken did 39 bombing raids, which is extraordinary. How long were you expected to live? Well, for the many men that died, many people that died, I would say round about 16. This Minlerton lad was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross and would eventually return to his home patch and marry his sweetheart, Doris. What did he do when he came back? <laughs> he became an accountant. <laughs> an ordinary bloke compelled to do extraordinary things. Just one of many stories contained within the walls of the Bublikari Military Museum. These are the heroes of your country and it's important we remember them because if it wasn't for people like him, Australia wouldn't be a free country. And women like the late Kathleen Mary Bowman. Born in Maitland and trained as a nurse at Stansbury, she served with the 2nd 7th Australian General Hospital in the Middle East. They took on, of course, all the heavy casualties from Tobruk, Alamein, places like that. And she must have seen quite a bit of horrifying things and a lot of death. If you didn't have these at the back of half, the men would have died, for sure. We appreciate them in the Malay and the Vietnam War too. Of course, they did a great job. Chris Saw served with the ADF in Indonesia, Malaysia and Vietnam, having come to Australia as a 15-year-old, enlisting two years later. In peacetime, he became a builder, a handy profession for a bloke who's built something truly remarkable, big enough to house trucks, jeeps and even the odd German aircraft. It was in bits in the shed and I actually put it back together again. It's not 100% perfect, but it gives you an idea of a balsa wood, aluminium and canvas built aircraft that was still being used in World War II. Would you fly in this? No way in the world. I'm glad we've improved on our aircraft myself personally. So uh, that is a stosh, ladies and gentlemen. From the bizarre to the touching and deeply personal, a treasure trove of memory and sacrifice. These people actually fought for this country and I believe that every peninsula should respect them. A lot of our memorials and that are kind of disappearing. Not this one though. It's located about eight kilometres north of Yorktown at the bottom of York Peninsula. An amazing place to visit in the lead up to Anzac Day. Coming up, supersized art on our west coast. When your home patch looks this good, why would you ever want to be inside? So it's no surprise that when the folks of the west coast town of Tumby Bay started thinking about community art, they thought about taking it outside. And they also thought big. Really big. At 30 metres high and 60 metres wide, this is some canvas. Viterra's Tumby Bay grain silos have undergone a month-long transformation under the rollers of world-renowned Argentinian muralist Martin Ron and his Australian assistant Matt Gorick. Even before it was finished, the work was attracting lots of attention and surprising visitors who thought this was just a sleepy little fishing town. We were down on the jetty in Tumby Bay and we got talking to one of the locals and we were just going to ask about fishing, what bait you use and what you catch and he was telling us about this mural and we hadn't even heard about it. So we drove out and had a look and I just couldn't believe it, it's just beautiful. I was lucky enough to get a close-up view mid-project and even though I was only about a third of the way up those towering silos, it still felt pretty precarious. But not to Martin who creates giant works all over the world and after this was heading off to Russia for a huge World Cup mural. I've been in Chile, USA, Belgium, Estonia, Spain. I go to Moscow right now. After this, I paint in Thailand, Malaysia, Germany, Australia. This is the second time here. Uh, Tommy Bay is your favorite though. Yeah, ah, Tommy Bay, yeah, I love this. The hidden paradise. Martin started thinking about historical themes for this work before realising there was something more compelling in the present day. And it was a chance find of a photo by local photographer Robert Lang of two lads plunging off the jetty that summed up this place for Martin. Getting the perspective just right on the curved surface of the silos presents a challenge. So the image has been projected onto them by night for an outline and filled in by day. Looking at it, you look at the face there now, it looks like a vinyl print. You know, it's, mm, it's so door. real, it's yeah, great. It's and the Beautiful. wrinkles in the feet and everything, it's yeah, amazing. It is, it's incredible. Yeah. 
Bringing Martin here was something of a coup for the local Progress Association, but member Dion Lebrun says the artist was even more excited than they were. About 15 kilometres south of Tumby, you get the first glimpse of the silos as you come over a hill, and he says he's getting a bit jumpy in the car, and he's saying, is that it, is that it? We're saying, yep, that's it, Martin. And each hill, it's getting bigger and closer. By the time we got to the intersection and turned into Tumby, I thought he was going to jump out the windscreen, so I did lock the doors of the car. We pulled into the car park and made him sit there for a minute just to soak it in. And then he gets out the car and there's this bloody guy who paints 50 metre skyscrapers all around the world, running through the car park, across all of this area, jumping in the air and air punching, going, this one's mine. The work joins two other silo showstoppers recently completed in South Australia. One in Kimber, painted by Cam Scale, and Guido Van Helton's creation in Coonalpin. And Tumby Bay's not done yet. Installations are popping up all over the town for the Colour Tumby Bay Street Art Festival, which Mayor Sam Telfer hopes will be an ongoing event. I think it's pretty special for us to be able to look at something for both locals and visitors alike. And street art's something which can be different from different artists, but something that brings people together and, and makes people want to come to Tumby Bay and also add to the quality of us living here. So, could Tumby Bay become the art capital of Air Peninsula? Well, aiming high seems like a pretty good start.